so uh yeah but we're on we're in our third class now um third of probably five in total uh that are remote and then after that we'll go in person um so i hope everyone's doing well um staying safe out there uh yeah so and uh let's see anything new ah so the um homework which is going to be due, you know, I don't know, it's exactly a week from right now. Uh, the first homework, I just posted it a little bit earlier. Um, you can check it out on the external website, dunkhanley.com slash econ1540 uh, or on Canvas. Okay, but it is, you do have to hand it in through Canvas um, since at least next week, well, next week, but that'll be our basically our last um yeah, remote class so um we'll do we'll do it through canvas um yeah so i guess maybe i should I'll, I'll i'll just go over it a little bit with you guys so basically the uh i'm gonna go through the uh the external website here so um you know you can, it's in the sort of web page html format or uh pdf if you want um it's only one question okay although this question is four subparts um and uh well actually you don't yeah, you don't know how to do this question yet. So, but today, uh, I should uh, hopefully uh, get through enough that you're going to be pretty well prepared to do this question once I go through Malthus. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, so I actually I'm going to postpone this overview of uh, the homework until basically at the end of lecture. Okay. Um, yeah. Don't let me forget. All right. And um, <clears throat> yeah. And then I also uh, put in some reading here. So you know the. If you look at the syllabus, um, let's see, go to the syllabus here. Uh, go to the syllabus, you know, I have this uh, sort of potentially optimistic plan for lecture. So this is like what I hope to accomplish at the, the speed I hope to go in terms of covering material. Once it becomes clear that I will actually be able to achieve that, and then I'll sort of move that stuff into here and be more specific about which page reading just you should be reading. Okay, so uh, for today, you should have done preface why nations fail and one through four. If you didn't, I'm actually going to postpone the reading discussion until we do in person, which is a little bit later. And once we we're going to get back into why nations fail anyway. Um, so you should be fine, actually, if you didn't happen to do the reading, but I know you all did. So um, yeah, because uh, yeah, that, you know, that way you can let it percolate for a little bit, you know, think about it, um, uh, reflect on it and such. Uh, and then we can we can have a full discussion of that. All right. So um, yeah, but then in terms of next week, okay, I'm gonna give you like 25 pages uh, from this facts of growth. Okay, so just the first 25 pages basically, um, and that's that's a paper by uh, Jones, Jones, I think just Chad Jones. Okay, um, <clears throat> and uh, you know you can click on the PDF here. So yeah, just Chad Jones. Uh, so just read those first 25 pages. Um, it's uh, it, I think it's pretty readable. Um, it's not like hyper dense or technical. It's just kind of going through uh, a broad overview of, of growth. Some of it you'll kind of, you know, I talked about earlier, um, but but a lot of it is going to be new. All right. And then, um, yeah, so that paper, uh, you know, after the first 25 pages, they actually start talking about stuff that's more actually covered in more detail in Beyond GDP. Okay. So then I'll just say, well, let's, let's just read the real Beyond GDP, which is a separate paper. Okay. And that'll be, that'll be for uh the week after that so the 31st okay um yeah all right and we're going to be covering stuff in class that's related to this okay so um yeah that's the plan okay uh it kind of seems like a lot but but these aren't huge readings okay um i'm assuming like a humanities course is going to have a substantially heavier, heavier reading load than that so but this is econ so we're going to do a little bit less reading a little bit more math okay um <clears throat> Yeah. All right. So that's that's kind of what's up, up on the radar, and that's all reflected on Canvas too. If you're tracking things, uh, scheduling things, based on like the incitement notifications, that should should be good there. All right. At least the first two here are on there, and the uh, and the homework, the, the problem set. Okay. So um, yeah. All right. So let's let's jump into the lectures. So because I need to, you know, I need to cover. Um, pull my mic a little bit closer here so you can hear me loud and clear. Uh, I need to cover uh, basically at least the intro to Malthus so you guys can start thinking about the homework. Okay, so I don't want to go too slow. All right. Um, yeah, okay, so historical growth this is our first lecture. Okay, I'll, we'll have 
you know, many more lectures popping up after this, but uh, it's the first lecture so far, so we already looked at all of this. Okay, so I'm gonna skip that. Um, but I, I did uh, have a little addendum because there were some questions. Uh, there were some questions um, uh, last class, okay? And I did not, I don't I believe there are basically two questions uh, that, that I, I recall. Okay, so the one was um, relating to like, where did uh, GDP originate? Like, where did the concept of GDP you know, like, you know, it's, it's sort of kind of makes sense. All right. But it's not a hundred percent clear how you implement it and things like that. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I just kind of looked at the Wikipedia article, I'll be honest. Um, I'm not ashamed of that. Uh, in fact, I'm a Wikipedia enthusiast. Um, but, uh, you know, basically what they said was there was this guy and I really like the picture of this guy. So I'm just going to show you this picture here. This guy, his name is uh, Sir William Petty here. He is holding a skull. Um, he was sort of one of those, you know, polymath folk, uh, just did a bunch of stuff. Uh, also was like, you know, born into a wealthy family. So he had plenty of time to do that. Um, like sort of was a <clears throat> agent of, of uh, England in Ireland in the mid 1600s. Um, uh, yeah, so he kind of started uh, thinking about a lot of that, just sort of like this concept of adding up economic activity of taking um, looking at sort of expenditures uh, on the part of people uh, and, and just sort of adding up and say, okay, this is how good this country is doing. You know, this is, this is the wealth of this nation, so to speak. Okay. So, um, and, and, and I think part of it was um, kind of like, there's this whole like scientific revolution enlightenment thing. And a lot of that was driven by well, a couple of different people, but like Francis Bacon, I think was what the main, sort of driving forces, he really kind of started up this whole, like, we're going to think about everything scientifically for better or for worse. We're just going to, you know, gonna quite qu try and quantify things. Um, and, and so on. So it started, you know, obviously the physical sciences are very amenable to, to that. Uh, but people also started then thinking about what if we quantified economics? Okay. Um, which wasn't even really a, a term, a, the, the term economics didn't even exist at that point. So at first it was political economy it happened later and then uh, eventually economics. Okay. So, that was part of the, the motivation. It's just sort of like, hey, let's use math to think about this. Okay, so um, yeah, so that was the, the sort of the beginning. Now, the thing is with GDP is it, it's tricky to think about what is the right way to do it because it's like, you know, you can you have this, what, what I guess I would call the double counting issue, which is that like, you know, if I buy something, you know, I buy something from one of you guys and then I sell it to someone else. Okay, if we add up the total revenue, the total sales at each step, okay, we're kind of double counting. What we really want to do is add up like how much value added am I producing? How much value added are you producing? How much value added is the next person in the supply chain producing? And just add those increments, okay? Right, or, or another way to think about it is just look at the final goods and look at the total revenue there, okay? But if you add up every stage, you're kind of, um, you're double counting things by a lot, okay? You just wanna look at value added, okay? Um, that's also why you know, if you, you know, if you look at some, some companies might have really large sales. Okay. But if you look at the profits, that's, that's a different thing, right? If they're just like shipping goods, stuff like that, or, or, or um, main, assembling things or something like that, they might have really high sales because they sell the final product, but their, their value add is going to be much lower. Okay. So, so this Willis guy sort of started thinking about it. Um, I think the next there are you know, people sort of refined it over the years and then Kuznets, Simon Kuznets in the, the early 20th century, uh, sort of um, institutionalized it. Okay, so he, he was a, in various government agencies and economic research institutions, and he really, and, and his, probably people that worked around him, uh, did a lot of the work of, okay, how do we operationalize this? You know, how do we go out and measure it consistently without error, um, without double counting and all of that? Okay, so the, the, the hard stuff that came a lot later, I think, of, of doing it really carefully and systematically. Um, yeah. Okay. And then it sort of propagated throughout the world, uh, that, that notion. Okay. So that's GP. All right. Um, let me just check one thing here. All right. Uh, okay. All right. Um, and let's see. Uh, yeah, so that, that's it for GDP. The other thing for the origins of GDP, I should say, the other thing is, uh, kind of, there was a, there was a question, I think the question was kind of related to the volatility uh, of GDP. 
Okay, um, we we're, we're kind of looking at some graphs, and it looked it kind of it kind of did look like potentially uh, things were getting I think less volatile over time, but there was also an issue of like we were you know in the in the earlier periods you're measuring it less often, and then you measure it more often later, so it might just sort of look artificially volatile. Okay, um, so uh, okay, so I actually did two things here. Well, the one on the right is really directly answering that question of volatility. The one on the left is slightly different, but those worthy of note. Um, so, so the first thing is, um, well, because of that different frequency of measurement issue, it's, it's hard to really do this systematically going really far back. So what I did was just look at the U S since 1820, which is where that Madison project data goes back to for the U S and there you have yearly data on, on this. Okay. So, well, let's start on the left. Okay. So first thing is if you just look at GP, it, it can be pretty noisy, but what I did here, um, and also it's, it just looks kind of like, uh, a line that's that's just growing exponentially. It's hard to see the details. So what I did here was I calculated the uh, the growth rate, the yearly growth rate, okay, in percentages, okay. So it's like you know two percent stuff, the stuff we usually see these days, um, and that you can see that's around where things lie. Uh, and then I also smoothed it so that it's like you know for you know the year nineteen hundred, you're looking back twenty the previous twenty five years. How what was the average GDP growth? Okay, and so here you can see there there is fluctuations, um, but but I think that just sort of two notable things. Okay, so one is first, you, know, you can see this massive crater uh, for the Great Depression, basically. That makes sense. Okay. Um, and then the other thing is, I, I guess you could say, is that it also divides things into two eras where it's sort of, you, you do have a noticeably higher growth rate in the, after the Great Depression, and probably more accurately after World War II, because uh, here it sort of recovers, and then after World War II, it really kicks up. Uh, and it versus before where you had lower growth rates. Okay, so I think I think that's the main story here. And I drew these dashed lines just as suggestive and say okay, you're around the one point four percent range here, but you're actually more about that two percent range up here. Okay. And the other thing you can say, or maybe it's too early to tell, is because you know you, you look at the end, that does go lower kind of back to that original level of around one point five uh in, in recent years, especially I think post two thousand eight. Okay. Um, but you know, that happened here too, and we came back, you know, it happened in the great depression. We came back. So it's hard to say, you know, what's going to happen after this, obviously, but, um, you know, but also if you go from, you could also draw a line, you know, from this peak with the, with the downward slope since, since the 1950s, basically. Okay. So, you know, it's hard to distinguish the signal from the noise here. Right. But, but you could, if you just ran a regression, say on this, you'd get a negative slope. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's the, the levels of the, gro the growth rate levels. Okay, so the mean growth rates over time. Uh, the other thing you can do is the volatility of growth rates. Okay, it's the same thing. It's just we're at a particular year, say 1900, we're looking at the previous 25 years and look at the standard deviation of growth rates over that period. And, and if there's a lot of variation in those growth rates within that period, this is going to be a high number and, and vice versa. Okay, so here you can see, um, you know, basically a kind of, was relatively low for a bit. I guess I should have anchored this at zero. You know, it's kind of a weird scaling here. I didn't think about that, but you know, it's relatively low here. Um, it goes way up starting before the Great Depression, right? It starts going up and up and up. And the Great Depression and World War II are gonna kind of artificially create a lot of volatility. Okay, so I wouldn't read 100% into the things around that period, but you can still see that it started going up before that. Okay, so. Um, and then it goes way down after World War II kind of sorts everything out, I guess, and then technological growth really accelerates. Um, and then it's kind of decreasing here. Okay, so it goes from like two and a half to like maybe one and a half. Okay, so that's that's a pretty big proportional decrease. Okay, so um, yeah, and 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 uh, yeah, I mean, the 2008 kind of maybe changed that a little bit, but not but not too much. Okay. So, so those are just two things I want to add in uh, based on some questions that, that people asked last time. Okay. Um, all right. So then, uh, yeah. Okay. So I guess we can move on to, uh, if, if, if you guys have any questions, you know, you can let me know now. Um, otherwise we can, we can move on into Malthus. All right. Okay. Um, all right, so then uh, let me, actually, it's the next slide. Okay, so this is the next slide. So we do have to do a little bit of math um, 
before uh before we do Malthus, not too much. Okay, just to kind of get you comfortable with with the kind of notation that we're gonna be using. All right, and I guess I guess at this point I'm also gonna jump over to the iPad. Where are you at? Okay, so the 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 I, I'm just gonna you know the slides are there and you can you can certainly reference those. Okay. Um but I'll I'll sort of it's easier and I think better to write things out on the iPad as if, you know, <clears throat> we were at a whiteboard or something like that. Okay. So um all right, so so you know, first we have to do this sort of intro to some mathematical notation, then we're going to go into to Malthus. Okay, so I guess I mean, so the first thing is, you know, we're we're going to be looking at different sort of we're going to be thinking about different sort of mathematical representations of of series, like a, a series of GDP numbers from from year to year, um, right over over time. Okay, so um, in general, I'll write you know why. That will be GDP. Uh, GDP, that's a capital Y. Okay, for now, later on, we'll be writing lowercase, but that's capital Y. All right, um, so that's just like, you know, what I, what I use for GDP. Okay, and so, you know, for instance, you might write, I might write, you know, Y sub 2005, which is GDP in the year 2005. Okay, um, or I just might, I'm, you know, since we're, we're dealing things with things that are sort of abstract here, we're, I might just write Y sub T. Okay, uh, for you know GDP in some year T. Okay, so you maybe you've seen that before. All right. Um, <clears throat> okay, and so that that's like the level, right? That's the level of GDP at a given time. Okay. Uh, the other thing we can do, um, you know, building off of that is we could write you know y t plus one. So you know, for some year T, think about the next year y t plus one, and subtract out T. So that's like y t plus one minus y t is the rate of change. Okay, so that's the year year over year change uh, in GDP. Okay, and that's useful, but but it's a little difficult to interpret because it's going to be mean different things for different countries at different times, right? That might be you know a certain rate of change might be really good for China, or really bad for China, really good for Luxembourg or something like that, right? So so there's a there's a scale issue that we haven't really taken care of. And that's why people like to use growth rates. Okay, and so what you can do there is take that rate of change and divide by the original level. Okay, and that's your um, growth rate. All right. So most of the time we're going to try and think about things. Well, it depends, but but oftentimes we're going to try and think about things in terms of growth rates because that provides a sort of scale and variant measure of how that rapidly things are growing. All right. Um, and that's, that's basically what I calculated in the, in the, when I showed those plots. Okay. So, um, all right. So that's, that's going to be your growth rate. All right. Um, and, and now the, the next thing is, uh, this is, <clears throat> um, this notation is all what's called discrete time notation. All right. So it's, it's, you know, uh, discrete in the sense of like, um, I don't know, having, you know, individual parts. Okay. So it's, you know, you have T, you have T plus one, you have T plus two, we don't have a continuum of time points. Okay. Um, and, and sort of the opposite of that, okay, is continuous time. All right. Okay. And there, um, you know, time instead of happening at, at discrete points is a continuum. Okay, so it just sort of flows continuously. All right, and in that case, you know, that GDP Y thing is really more like a function. Okay, so it maps from T, a point in time, into a, a level for GDP, and it varies continuously over time. Okay, I guess it could jump, but it, it varies and, and has a value at every point in time. Okay, so, um, you know, you know this, and this is, uh, let me make sure you can actually see that. So. Um, so we're going to be doing stuff in continuous time. All right. Um, it's not really that important either way. It just makes things a little bit easier in terms of notation. Um, you know, in terms of like practical, uh, considerations, I mean, it doesn't really matter how GDP is varying from second to second, right? You know, uh, the only people that care about really high frequency changes in series like this would be like financial people that are trying to like, um, trade really rapidly on information or something. But for GDP, we really, the most we care about maybe is monthly. Okay. And usually quarterly is the, the highest granularity that people go to. 
Okay, so but so this is really just more of a mathematical convenience to use continuous time. But but it doesn't I don't think it misleads us, it just makes things a little bit easier. Okay. Um okay, so then you know we can do the same progression though. So this would be the level of GDP. Okay, we can think about the rate of change, okay, and there we know we have if we have a function, we can take a derivative, okay? And I'm the way I'm gonna write a derivative is with a little dot over the top of it, so that'll call it y dot at time t. That's like engineering style notation or physics, I guess. Um, and that's, that's okay, when I write triple equals, that means defined, but I'll, I'll, I'll just write equals. That's that's equivalent to saying, you know, dy dt. Okay, I guess I should, you know, evaluate it at t equals t or whatever, but you know, that's the derivative with respect to time. Okay, so this is the rate of change. Okay. Uh, that's analogous to yt plus one minus yt. Okay, and then the other thing we can do to move into a growth rate to, to take care of that um, uh, scale issue is define what I'll call g of t. That's a growth, it's, it's a growth rate of t. I'll just call it g. Um, and that's gonna be y dot of t over y of t. So you take the derivative and divide by the value itself. Okay, that's your growth rate. All right. So those are sort of the building blocks that we're going to have. And, you know, sometimes I might write like g sub y, okay, of t, because we could, you can calculate the growth rate of y, you could calculate the growth rate of some other series x, okay, so you might want to say the growth rate of something, okay, so sometimes I'll write g sub y, sometimes when it's, it's obvious what I'm talking about, maybe I'll just write g, but, it, you know, usually, hopefully, it, it'll be, you'll be able to, to infer from the context, okay? Um, all right, so that that's sort of how we're going to do things in continuous time. Okay, and so um, and so and, and I guess I guess I should say like what is it? How are we going to be using this? You know, because there's there's theory and there's data. Okay, so when I write y of t, that could be describing a data point. Okay, when I write the derivative of y of t, well, we don't have continuous data, right? Uh, we just have data year year to year, so. It's, it, there is an analog you can look at year to year and approximate, say it's approximately equal to the derivative, okay? But usually when we use this stuff, we're going to be talking about theories, okay? You know, a theory of how does GDP change? You know, it changes because there's changes in labor and capital and technology, and we'll quantify, you know, y dot equals something, or the growth rate of y equals something that comes from theory, okay? And then later on, we'll map that into data and see if it actually generates sensible predictions, okay? So this is mostly a theoretical tool here. Okay, so, all right, um, yeah, and then I guess the other thing is that, uh, you know, if, if you think about, you know, relating these two, you know, the discrete uh, way of thinking about things versus the um, continuous way of thinking about things, so there, uh, you know, if, if you just think about, you know, um, uh, you know, the continuous time can be thought of as a discrete time setting where you take the 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 length of time that's elapsed between t and t plus one as that goes to zero. If you think about the like the definition of like a derivative, remember like taking the limit as h goes to zero or you know, something like that. It's kind of the same thing. You're just taking the you're taking the limit as this time step goes to zero. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's one way to think about continuous time. Okay. In the slides I have a, a formal statement of that. Okay, but it basically when you go to continuous time, it's it's the same sort of ideas taking discrete time in the limit as the time step goes to zero. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, so, so I guess, you know, so that's, that's how we're going to be doing things with continuous time. All right. And I guess I'll, I want to say a little bit more about growth rates. Okay. And how those kind of work. All right. Because this is an economic growth course also, uh, and, and growth rates are going to be important. And that's, that's one way we're going to describe economic growth. Okay. So let's, let's think about it growth rates. All right. So, um, yeah, so, so I guess what I want to say is, um, you can, you know, when, when we, um, when we look, you know, when we're looking at all that GDP data, okay. Uh, you know, a lot of the times it was growing exponentially. It looked like an exponential growth. Okay. Especially when you look at the modern era. Okay. Um, and you know, I, at some point, I think I showed you a logarithmic plot, okay, where you can see that the, if you plot the logarithm of an exponentially growing data series, then it looks linear, okay? 
So what would that look like in this notation if you had something that was growing exponentially? Okay, so let's say uh, so you got something growing at rate um, alpha. Okay, so I'll just alpha is just some positive number. Okay, um, so uh, you know basically what that means is that, and let's say it's that thing is yt that's growing. That yt is going to look like some initial value y zero times e to the alpha t. Okay. And okay, sorry. When I when I write exp to the alpha t, it's just you know this is the same as if I were to write like e raised to the alpha t. Okay. But it's just it's hard. I don't have great handwriting. It's hard to, to pull that off. So I'll write exp uh, of alpha t. Okay. So um, that's what it looks like. You know, so alpha is positive t as it moves through time, maps through the exponential function and produces a lot of growth. Okay, a lot of increase uh, that looks looks uh, like that that usual kind of hockey stick looking thing. All right, um, and then so what we can do is then think about those that progression. Okay, so think about the level, think about the rate of change. Okay, so you know if y of t is just growing exponentially at rate alpha. Okay, and it looks like that exponential form. Then if you take the derivative, okay, you're going to get what well, you get like y zero. That's just a constant. That's your starting point, um, <clears throat> and then. Uh, You'll, you'll get like an alpha from the chain rule and then e to the alpha, uh, e to the alpha t. Okay, so the, the derivative exponential, you just pop off a chain rule alpha, okay? Um, and it, and you know, you can see that that's gonna be equal to, you know, it's it, that's just alpha times the thing that we started with, right? So that's just alpha times y of t. If you factor out the alpha, then you're just left with y zero e to the alpha t, which is y zero, which is just y t itself, okay? So y dot equals alpha times y t. Okay, so the rate of change is proportional, right? So you know the rate of change is just alpha times the level. All right, that's proportionality. And if you move that alpha, so you move that y t over, you know you get y dot of t divided by y of t is equal to alpha. Okay, and then we know that 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 ratio there is that's just g of t, g sub y. I guess I'm saying of t. All right. That's the growth rate that we defined. Uh, actually, here you probably want to see that. Um, that's the growth rate that we defined. Okay, so the growth rate is exactly equal to alpha. If you start out with just something that, that has an exponential form, then the growth rate is constant and equal to alpha. Okay. Um, all right, and then the the reverse is true. Okay, so if I tell you, oh, there's some series out there and it's growing constantly at rate alpha, then you know it is going to look exactly like this. Okay. You know, it's growing rate alpha. Let's say I also tell you where it starts at y zero, then it's going to look exactly like this. Okay. So those, those two things are equivalent. Those statements so that it, it has this functional form and it's growing at a constant rate alpha. Those are, those are logically equivalent, mathematically equivalent. Okay. Um, yeah. And then the other thing is, uh, and, and you can, sh if, if you, if you want to do the reverse thing and say, you know, you know, it starts, grows at rate alpha, you can basically, um, <clears throat> so, so one, one useful thing to know about this is, this is also equal to, uh, the derivative of the log of Y. I'll write it out and argue that it's true. Okay. So I T. So if you take log of Y of T, and then you take the derivative of that whole thing, that's equal to Y dot over Y because the log, the derivative of the log of Y is just one over Y, right? But because y is a function of t, you need to use the chain rule. And the chain rule just gives you the derivative of that thing inside, which is y dot of t. Okay, so the derivative of the log is equal to y dot over y. Okay, and that and that's that's the growth rate. Okay, so the, the derivative of the log is the growth rate, is what I'm saying. Okay. Um, and that last statement, okay, is really is the mathematical version of what I said before, which is that if you look at if you if you have an exponential series in the data and you look at you plot it in logarithms, it should look linear. Okay, that's the same thing. Okay, because imagine we start with this series. Okay, and we plug it in. We say log of y t. What is that? Okay, well, it's going to be. <clears throat> you look at these. The log of y of t is going to be basically the log of y zero plus the log of this thing. Okay, it's going to be the log of y zero. The initial condition plus the log of e to the alpha t, which they well, they cancel each other out, so it's just alpha, alpha t. So log and exponential are inverse functions of one another. So the log of the exponent is just the thing inside, alpha t, 
okay? So the log of yt is indeed linear in time, okay? It looks like a straight line when you graph it over time. And that slope is exactly the growth rate alpha, okay? So if, if you want to, if you just had a picture of like a data series in logs, you, you could measure the slope and then that would be the growth rate, okay? That's another way to do it. It's a weird way, but it's a way to do it, okay? Um, all right, so that's that's sort of, those are, I think what you need to know. I, I think the, the um, well, it's good to just have a general feel for how this stuff works and how the notation works. Um, the logarithm thing I think is useful, okay? Um, and it actually means that uh, this this thing here, this side, the, that the fact that the growth, you know, I guess these are also equal, the growth rate is equal to the derivative of the log, that also means that like stuff that's true about logarithms is kind of also true about um, growth rates. So like those, you know, those rules for logarithms, the log of a times b is the log of a plus the log of b. Well, that's true about growth rates. The growth rate of a times b is the growth rate of a plus the growth rate of b. Okay, so all of those rules for logarithms that you maybe learned in high school or whatever map into uh, growth rates as well. Okay, once we need those, I'll bring them out again and show you specifically what I mean. But but that's just sort of important. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So then, uh, yeah, I, I have some, a little bit more stuff in the in the notes. So okay, if you want, there, there I go through it sort of in a little bit more detail. Okay. Um, and I also have an example data series in the notes here. I'll just show this to you right now. Uh, you know, of just thinking about okay, plotting an exponential series. Okay, so here's the GDP of China, which has been growing very rapidly over time. Um, and then here I'm plotting it in logs. Okay. So this is like, well, this is actually the GDP. It's not GDP per capita. That's why it's so big. So this is like uh, a million, I guess that's a million, right? That seems kind of small. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Maybe it is. I don't know. Um, and then 10 million, hundred million and so on. Um, that's probably in thousands or something. It might be in thousands, who knows? Okay, but you can see the, the important part is um, it looks exponential in levels. And then when you plot the log, it does indeed look approximately linear. Okay, and if you were to measure that slope, um, <clears throat> well, you couldn't do it from here because of the axes, but if you were to measure the slope, it would be the, the growth rate, which is uh, growth rate for, for, for overall GDP in China, I think has been over this period was probably around eight to 10%, I would guess on average, okay? Uh, although it is obviously tapering off at the end because you can only grow at 10% for so long, okay? Eventually you start reaching the frontier of technology and stuff and and, and you, you, there's just nowhere left to go, okay? Um, okay, so then uh, let's go back to the slides. What, what am I doing here? Okay, there we go, uh, to, the, to the iPad. Um, all right. Okay. And so what we can do now, all right, is, is, well, we're going to get towards talking about Malthus. Okay. Um, let's see. So I'm trying to think how much I can get away with here. Um, I think we should just go right into Malthus. Okay. There's, there's one or two other things which may be useful in the notes. Okay. I'm going to skip over those. We, we basically, I think we, we have the appropriate tools to talk about Malthus now. All right, so um, let me go back to the slides. Okay. Um, all right, so so let me. I'll give you a little bit of an intro to mouth this, just the assumptions, and then we can work through the the math, which is not too bad. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, basically. Um, I think I, I probably said, I think I said this at the end last time, you know, so Malthus basically has this theory that, that will produce stagnation. Okay. And I've kind of updated it and, and redefined it in modern terms. Okay. But it's a theory that produces stagnation. Okay. And kind of, and, and it, that matches pretty well with the pre-1800 experience and it doesn't match so well with the post-1800 experience, which ironically 1800 was around when Malthus was alive. Okay. Um, and uh, and essentially, you know, so you so on the slide here, you know, I have this sort of obvious breakdown that GDP, if you multiply and divide by population, is just GDP per capita times population. Okay, um, it's it's the it's the product of those two things. Okay, and and actually, what Malthus's theory posits is basically 
a two-way relationship between the standard of living, GDP per capita, and population, in the sense that the population growth rate is a function of the standard of living, okay, which, which I think is plausible. Uh, and then the standard of living is a function of population, okay? So, um, <clears throat> all right, so then that first direction, okay, from uh, this, I can use my mouse here, yeah. Uh, that first direction from the standard of living into population, okay? Uh, so really it's population growth, okay? So basically what it's saying is that the, the higher the standard of living, the um, higher population growth will be, okay? And now population growth is the product of kind of two forces, which is, you know, basically like the, the birth rate um, kind of plus the, the uh, infant survival rate and everything like that, uh, minus the death rate, okay? So, but it's, you know, it, it makes sense that as the standard of living goes up, that say the death rate would go down and hence the, the growth of population would go up, okay? Uh, the birth rate is a little bit less clear, okay, especially coming from a modern perspective, okay? What Malthus assumes and, and what you can see, I, I think what you, you can see if you look really far back in the data, uh, or at least of like estimates of, of, of what the data might have been, um, is, is this increasing relationship between the standard of living and population, okay? So that the richer people are, the more resources they have and they're able to have more children, or maybe their children are more likely to survive childhood and, and so on. Okay, so um, there's this increasing relationship, right? Now that's confusing from a modern perspective because what we see in the world kind of over, both over time and also just across uh, cross-sectionally at a given time is the exact opposite. The richer a country is, the lower its birth rate especially is, right? Uh, the death rate thing is kind of probably always gonna be true to some extent. But if you look at birth rates, you know, the richer countries actually tend to have lower birth rates. Okay. So, and, and, uh, you know, so, so if you look at, you know, the U S this is true. Okay. We've gotten richer, the birth rates go down. Even if you look in the U S cross-sectionally across income, right. Uh, higher income people have lower birth rates. Um, you can look at other countries, Europe, this is going to be true to some extent. Uh, uh, Korea, China, to some extent have, have pretty low I think, well, Korea and Japan have very low birth rates. Okay, so, um, yeah, so so you see the exact opposite. So that's confusing, but it doesn't mean it's not true because we're, we're thinking about a very different time. Okay, we're thinking about standard of livings that are way, way lower compared to what we are uh, in the modern era. Okay, all right, so that's so that's one thing. Okay, and, I'll, and I'll, that's where a lot of the math is going to happen, sort of that relationship. Okay, and remember that was going from standard of living to population. Now the other direction, population to standard of living, is 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 really it's kind of just like an overcrowding story you have the the whole logic of the model is that you have a fixed amount of land and the more people you have the less land per person everyone has so more people you have a smaller plot let's say um and so you produce less per person and so your standard of living goes down so it's just a really mechanical like you have a fixed pie with more people every individual person gets less okay so that may not be reasonable right and that's not reasonable today, basically, and a lot for a lot of reasons because we have capital uh, and things that we can just sort of produce more and more and more of and accumulate. Unlike land, at least assumed to be fixed here. Okay, there's still a lot of land to. There's a lot of empty land in the world, right? So, um, but but that's the assumption. Okay, so um, I think I, I think I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself talking about the slides here. Okay, so so basically these three assumptions, this, the the major assumptions that, that I as I see them are. Okay, so number one is you have a fixed amount of land and a variable population, okay, which produces that sort of crowding dynamic where you have more people leads to less resources per person. Um, then you have number two is that the population growth is positively related to the standard of living. That's what this little swizzle things here, thing here means, the, the, that those are positively related, okay? Um, and then the third assumption it kind of is is basically saying that there's no like modern capital. It's all just like it's a it's an agrarian economy. You basically have a plot of land that you grow on with the land and yourself, the labor, and that's it. That's how you that's how you survive. Okay. Um, and if you have all of that, then you get this Malthusian stagnation result. Okay. So now um, let's 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 do the math. Okay. So like before, this is. This is all reflected in the slides. I'm going to write it out 
um, on my iPad here, okay, because I think it's just a little easier. All right, now um, I've started a new page here. All right, so then, um, okay, uh, Malthus. Old Tommy Malthus. All right. Um, okay, so what we want to do is take those assumptions and, yeah, sure, sure. Mm-hmm. So, um, let's think. So, so you're, you're saying the population increases. Okay. So that, well, there, okay. So there's two things that are you asking? Why is it that, um, uh, this, a higher standard of living leads to more population growth or, or the other way around? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So that, that, that assumption is saying, I guess, um, that the cause that the, the, that there is a causal relationship from standard of living to population growth, I guess that, that people, if they have today, they have a higher standard of living than the, the, the population growth rate will be higher today. All right. Okay. Um, and, and yeah, so, and, and there's a whole issue like, you know, they, sort of that not what we see today. We we're arguing that's what we would see at much lower standards of living. Okay, because it's sort of like different people are facing different constraints. So I'll talk more about that, like why that may be reasonable or not, um, a little bit later on. Okay. All right. Yep. Yep. Thanks. Thanks for asking. All right. So um, okay. So so we're gonna do. Uh, yeah. So we're so we're gonna operationalize this, sort of mathematically. Okay. Um, and so the first thing we're going to do is this is, this is that assumption basically that the standard of living influ directly influences the population growth. Okay. And the way that, uh, that we're going to write that. Okay. So first let me define some terms here. So again, Y is going to be output, which is, which is like our, you know, basically GDP. Okay. So like output is sort of like the theoretical object and GDP is like what we measure, I guess they're the same thing. All right. Um, L is going to be population, but also the labor force because everyone basically just works on their farm. Okay, so that's why it's L. Um, we have uh, K later on. It'll show up is is land. Okay, and and so K usually in an economic model like this, K is capital. But what but basically what I'm saying is like there is capital, but all it's just land. There's no big machines. Maybe you have some tools, but we're kind of ignoring that. There's no machines or buildings or factories or anything like that. It's just land. It's a very simple agrarian economy. Okay. So usually people write K for capital, like Marx, you know, it does capital, everything. Um, and also C is already taken for consumption. Um, and so people write K for capital and here it's, it's actually land, which is confusing because we also have L, but we'll have, we'll have to learn a lot with it. Okay. So um, population and labor basically in land are going to combine to produce output. Okay. Um, and then, yeah. Okay. So th those are the important things for now in terms of the terminology. Okay. So let's, so let's talk about that relationship between standard of living and population growth. Okay. And, and so sometimes I'll call this like a demographic rule because demographics is like the study of populations. Okay. So what we're going to say here, and this is, this is just a straight up assumption. I'm not driving this from anywhere. Okay. I'm just asserting it, uh, is that the growth rate of population. Okay. At a given time will be equal to some constant theta, okay, times y over l. So y over l is output per person. That's our standard of living. Okay, I guess I should say, you know, this the ratio of those two things is output per person. We're going to call that standard of living. Or the GDP per capita is another thing we could call it. All right, y over l minus some value y bar. Okay. All right, so it's theta times that standard of living minus some value y bar. Okay. And so, uh, theta, it's just a, it's like a number that controls the strength of this relationship. Okay. So it's not that important, honestly. Um, y bar is a little bit more important. It's, you can think about it as like a minimum amount of food or whatever you need to be to survive or to maybe to be comfortable. Okay. At least by 
you know old times standards um uh, so it's like some minimum amount of of uh consumption or out, output per person okay and so what you do is one way to think about it is okay you have a certain uh you're a person and you know the average person has y over l output right so there's y is total output the average person has y over l output for themselves they consume y bar to get comfortable and then after that they say oh i have enough i have excess resources i'll have kids and and spoil the kids with those excess resources and and whatever okay so um that's the idea and, and so the more excess resources you have the more children you can have okay that's one story and that that's more of like a, a reproduction birth rate story Okay. You can also think about a death rate story, which is you have more resources, you're better fed. Therefore, people die of disease and other things at lower rates. And hence, the growth rate of population will also be higher because the death rate is lower. Okay. Death rate goes down, growth rate of population goes up, other things being equal. Okay. So you could tell different stories about what this equation means and where it comes from. All that matters is that it's a positive relationship, that this y over l um, here, you know, this increases, then L that over L increases. That's going to be true as long as theta is positive. Okay. Which it is. All right. So that, that's assumption. Well, I'm going to, that's actually not assumption. That's actually assumption number two on the previous slide, but I'll, so I'll label it too. Okay. All right. So that's, and that, that is our assumption that goes from uh, the standard of living into population, right? So it's, it's the causal error runs from standard of living causes a certain rate of change or growth rate of population. Okay. Um, all right. So that's, that's important equation. That's probably the most important equation. Okay. Um, and, and, and even from this, you know, and I, I should plot it. Okay. Uh, so let's plot it. All right. So if we plot it, I mean, it's a straight line relating Y over L and the growth rate L not over L of population. It's positive. Uh, it can be negative. Okay. So this is our zero point here. It can be negative as at some point. It starts down here and then it goes up and crosses through the origin. It's going to cross through the origin exactly at Y bar. So when Y over L equals Y bar, this thing is zero. So that's where the L dot over L is zero. That's where it crosses there. So it's for low levels of output and standard of living, you're going to have negative population growth. And for high levels, you're going to have positive population growth. And there's some point that's exactly Y bar where those are going to cancel and it's going to be equal to zero. Okay, so so what we do know is that if your output per person for whatever reason is equal to Y bar, that's your that's the country or area you're living in, the population growth rate will be zero. Hence, the population will be constant. Okay, so if we're looking for a steady state where things aren't moving around, where L dot is equal to zero, that means that Y over L is equal to Y bar. Okay, and that's basically what we're going to see. And uh, there's one more equation that we're going to use to kind of provide you know more information on that but basically what we're going to see is that the population will converge to some fixed value some value that we can characterize uh and at that point it won't change and the standard of living will be y bar now you remember y bar is like just enough what you need to just be alive or be comfortable so it's not good okay so this isn't a good outcome that's why we call it stagnation and you're not growing at all you're just staying there forever okay so that's that's why that's it's it's generally considered to be bad all right. Um, okay. So then uh, let's introduce the next assumption. Okay. So I guess this is maybe akin to number three, which is that production is undertaken with with uh, land and labor and also a little bit of technology. Okay. And the way we're going to write that is that production output Y is equal to some Z thing, which is technology. Okay. Times... Uh, in the slides, uh, for some reason, instead of K, I have X. I'm going to fix that right after lecture, but if you're looking at the slides now, it, where it says X, that should be K. I'm going to use K here, all right? So K to the alpha times... Also, I have beta. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to change these slides. I didn't realize that I'd use some weird notation. Okay, so um, you're going to have output. Y is going to be equal to technology Z times K, you're the amount of land that you have to the alpha, times L, the amount of population that you have to the one minus alpha. Okay, so uh, this is a standard um, production function called the Cobb-Douglas production function. 
I'm partial to it because my name is Douglas. Um, but yeah, it's a it, it's probably the most common production function that we'll see in macro just because it has certain good properties. Okay, so uh, and in particular, in in this case, um, some of the properties are going to be well, it, it's it's what's called a constant returns to scale. So if you double the amount of land k that you have and double the population and keep them in the same proportion you're going to double the amount of output right because you're going to get two to the alpha times two to the one minus alpha and a factor out as a two okay so it's it's it thinks if you double the amount of inputs you double the amount of outputs that's constant returns to scale all right but if you you know if you keep l fixed and increase k that's a concave function because alpha is between zero and one Okay, so it's going to be some concave function that's decreasing returns to scale in single input. So if you keep one fixed and change the other, it's decreasing returns. If you keep k fixed and change l, it's decreasing returns. But if you if you scale them both up and down, it's constant returns. Okay, so that's kind of um, useful. Okay, and and I'll show you why that is just now. Okay, so um, so start with this, and again this product this equation this production function I'm just asserting. This is an assumption of the model, okay? So what we're really interested in is not so much output per se, but we're interested in output per person, okay? Um, and so that's going to be like y over L. So it'd be Z, I'll write it out, k to the alpha, L to the one minus alpha over L, all right? Now the, the L to the one minus alpha divided by L is just L to the minus alpha, okay? So this is Z, k to the alpha, L to the minus alpha, so we simplified it a little bit. Now those have those both have an alpha power, although one has a minus in front of it. But we can combine that into basically, you know, that's like k of k over l to the alpha. Okay, my alphas sometimes turn into twos, so let's let's get that one in line there. All right, so that's you know k of the alpha times l to the minus alpha is just k over l, the whole thing raised to the alpha. Okay, just move that out down at the bottom, get rid of the minus sign. Okay, so so that's what we get at the end of the day. Okay, and just and just to summarize where we started and where we ended up, in such a way that my head is not obscuring it. Uh, we're gonna say y over l is equal to z. Okay, over l. So this is just a summary. Okay, so this is actually kind of important. So I'm gonna put a box around it. All right. So so this is saying that your output per person is some function of the amount of land that you have per person. Okay, so if you take the amount of land you have per person, raise it to the alpha, multiply by your technology Z, that gives you output per person. And if you increase your land per person, that raises, raises your output per person. If you decrease your land per person, that decreases your output per person. Okay, so, and, and what, that, um, what that means is that, well, the amount of land is fixed. So it means if we increase the amount of population, the amount of people, the land is fixed, then that means that the amount of land per person goes down and the alpha per person goes down, right? So what that means is that L goes up, standard of living goes down and vice versa. Okay, that's that that's that crowding, overcrowding dynamic that you have, okay? And it depends heavily on, well, this production function and the fact that the amount of land is fixed. Either of those things are not true, then maybe this might not be true, okay? So if you want to think about pictorially, so the way I usually draw it, here's the world, your land, K, all right? And you got a bunch of people, all right? And basically they just have their little domains, you know? So we can like draw a bunch of things. That, I, I don't know if it matters if they're the same size. Obviously there's inequality in the world. So, you know, you got a bunch of people that live on their little plots of land, okay? And if you add more people, you invariably have to make the average plot size smaller. Okay, so that's that overcrowding dynamic. All right. Um, yeah, so that's and 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 that that is critically important here. Okay. Um, let me show point the right thing. That's critically important here. Okay, and, and it's, it's sort of encoded by this equation. Okay, which is that you increase L, it's in the denominator here, that pushes the output per person down. Okay. So now we can combine these two things. Okay, so this this equation up here. Okay, I need to make sure I'm not obscuring things. Can I do it? Yeah. So this equation up here, uh, I'll also put a box around. No. So that we said that that's 
that's required in that or that's a if we're in steady state okay then that standard of living is equal to y bar okay we have this equation right here too which also has a y over l okay so we can combine those two things we combine them we basically get y bar is equal to y over l is equal to z k over l the alpha okay so that's our new equation where we've combined these two things that came from our two different assumptions all right and that and and what what did we accomplish by doing that well um basically what we accomplished is that uh we know y bar is some parameter of the model it's just a number okay z bar is just a number z is just a number alpha is a number k is a number the only thing we don't really know that's sort of endogenous and determined by the dynamics of the model is l okay so we can solve for l all right so let's kind of rearrange stuff okay so we want to get l so k over l to the alpha let's say should be equal to y bar over z by moving that z around okay uh and then that means that k over l is equal to y bar over z to the one over alpha okay so that's how you cancel out a, a power all right um <clears throat> and actually you know we want to find l okay so let's flip this equation upside down l over k on the left and then z over y bar okay so i just flipped both sides okay and then the last thing we can do is move that k over and so we get l is equal to k times z over y bar to the one over alpha okay all right so that's important too and you can I, maybe i'll call this like l star this is like the equilibrium value for l once all the dynamics have sorted out then that's going to be your your equilibrium value for l okay so so that's that's pretty much it okay so so to summarize okay in steady state sometimes i'll call y over l a little y uh this is going to be equal to y bar oh that's that's kind of confusing so i'll just keep it like this all right so um to summarize i guess you could say is that the the eventual outcome in some kind of like steady state or equilibrium is going to be your standard of living equals y bar which i'm saying isn't very good it's sort of a minimum and your population is going to converge to this particular value okay so um so yeah so that's that's it i mean and i guess um so so that achieves what we want to achieve basically stagnation you know there's no long-term growth in either standard of living or population they're both they both just kind of reach fixed values and that's it okay um <clears throat> okay and so you know maybe that's not that hard because um you're uh we don't have any external driving forces that would be creating growth anyway so so it's, maybe it's not surprising that the outcome is stagnation because there's nothing changing in the background that would be driving growth okay um but even if you do have stuff forces app writing on this environment uh you still wouldn't really get long-term growth okay so imagine that you had um actually yeah okay so first let me describe the dynamics to you okay and then we can we can, we can think about uh the, the forces okay so so how, how can we think about the dynamics here okay so the way i i like to do it is graphically okay so let's go back to that graph that we drew y over l and l dot over l all right um <clears throat> this is zero here okay and we can draw in our demographic function it looks like this all right where there's that intersection point here and y bar okay so this thing is this is like l dot over l is equal to theta y over l minus y bar okay and also what we're gonna also want to know is that standard of living equation y over l is the k over l to the alpha it's going to be useful all right so from this from this this stuff here alone we can basically figure that the dynamics pretty easily okay so how are we going to do this all right well first we need to figure out where we are once we figure out where we are we're going to figure out where we're going and then we're just going to keep repeating that cycle over time and iterating until we reach a steady state. 
Okay, so let's say we start somewhere down here. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that y over l is equal to some initial value right here. And we're gonna, and then I'll just sort of map it down to this line. Okay, so so what is that in the context here? That means y over l is some initial value. So there's some value for z. That's just the level of technology. There's some amount of land, and there's some initial value for l, the initial population. It's just that's just given to us. Okay, and that means there's some initial value for y over l if we if we apply it to this function and we calculate it with this function. All right, so that gives us a point where we're starting here, uh, uh, an initial y over l point, and then we can map it onto this curve. Uh, you got a question there or no? Okay, all right. Um, we can map it onto this curve, all right? And what does that tell us? Well, that tells us from this curve, it's below the zero line. That means L dot over L is negative, right? This is zero. That's where it's zero. If we're down here, L dot over L is negative. The population is shrinking, okay? And what happens then? The population goes down, L goes down over time. So we can go to the next time step. I know this is continuous, but we just go to the next time step. L has gone down because of this rule. Uh, if L goes down, it's like the, the opposite of crowding. L goes down, alpha proportions goes up. Because L goes down, everyone has a little bit more land. They produce a little bit more for themselves, okay? And so alpha per person goes up, all right? That means we move right in this graph, okay? So we're going to move right. And I'll, I'll draw it like we're moving up and right because we still want to think about sort of being somewhere on this line. Okay, so we're going to move right in y over l space and hence also up in uh, l dot over l space. So we're going to move up to here. Okay, and then if you apply the same logic again, uh, it, it's the same as long as we're below this line. We're below this line. That's our new y over l. That still means that l dot over l is negative, although slightly less so. And hence l is going to go down. The standard of living is going to go up and we're going to move right and up in this space. And that's just going to keep being true until we get to this point, y bar. Okay, and once we're there, we don't go anywhere. We're at y bar, L dot over L zero, the population doesn't change. We remain where we are, and that just keeps being true all the way down. All right, so that's a, that's sort of a, a stable point. All right, now the only thing we want to see is what happens if we start on the high side. Okay, so what, what happens if we start out in a situation where uh, our standard of living is relatively high, which which means that the population is relatively low. Okay, so it's a relatively sparsely populated area. Everyone has big estates that they grow their um, food on and they, they live a good life. And as a result, they also uh, expand the population. Okay, then it's the reverse. L goes up, hence this the denominator. Y over L goes down. We move left and also downwards like this, okay? And that, that same logic holds as long as we're above the line, the zero line. So we're gonna keep moving here until we get to Y bar, okay? So it's totally stable. No matter where you start, you're always gonna go up and end up back at Y bar, regardless of whether you start on the high side or the low side in terms of standard of living, okay? Um, yeah, so that's it, okay? So that's how you can think about that dyna dynamics. Now, when you do your homework, it's gonna, you know, think think in terms of a graph like this. I'm gonna give you a function, but it's not gonna be this function. It's actually gonna be the reverse. It's gonna be going down the little, it'll have certain limits, but it's gonna be going down. Okay, so you're gonna think about the opposite case in the homework, all right? You can use the same tools and the same logic, okay, but, but I'm gonna flip this assumption to one that's actually more reasonable by modern standards, okay? Um, <clears throat> all right, so then, uh, Let's see. Um, yeah, so 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 the, that's how you can think about the dynamics. It's just draw this graph, think about where you are and how you move around in the space, and use these, especially this equation, okay, to relate L and Y over L, okay. Um, yeah, okay. And then uh, the the other thing is, like I said before, we can also think about what happens if you have shocks to this environment, okay. So, for instance, what happens if you have a positive technology shock that um, someone discovers a new method of agriculture that improves productivity by a lot, okay? Well, what's gonna happen is in the short run, you know, today, basically, K is always fixed, L is, is some number, okay? So in, in the immediate sense, you have a higher Z now, and so this goes up, okay? So basically, let's say you were, you were cruising along at your Malthusian stagnation at Y bar, 
if you have a big jump in Z, that's basically going to bump you up to like this point here. Okay. But then what happens is the Malthusian mechanism kicks back in again. Okay. Everything I said before that you have high standard of living, hence high population growth, hence L goes up, Y over L goes down over time, and you're just going to cruise back down and eventually return to Y bar. Okay. So that's in my mind, really the most depressing part of this prediction of stagnation is that even if you have a, a big improvement in technology that gets kind of diffused into a higher population, but the standard of living remains the same. Okay. So just, just going back to that equation that we derived here, it is true that the population will get bigger. Okay. But the standard of living in the long run won't change. You'll, you'll get higher population and that increased sort of crowding will perfectly counteract that increase in technology so that the Z will have gone up, but then L will go up to perfectly counteract that. Okay. So that's kind of the most depressing part of the prediction is that you can't even get out of it with technology. Okay. And even if I, you can calculate this is a little bit more advanced, but if you have a continual growth in uh, technology, even then you don't get one, well, you don't get long run growth. Okay. So you get a little bit better, you get a, you get a little bit better standard of living, but you don't get a long run growth in the standard of living. You still have stagnation. Okay. So yeah. Um, yeah. So that's the prediction now. Okay. So, so, uh, what we're going to do, I'm almost out of time here. What we're going to do going forward. Okay. Is hopefully sort of solidify our knowledge of this core Malthusian model. Okay. Uh, and then also trying to break, try and find ways to break it. We don't like this prediction, both because it's bad in an normative sense, and it's also bad in a positive sense because it doesn't reflect what we see in the world for the most part. Okay. So we want to break it because it seems to be not consistent with what we see. And we also want to understand maybe in breaking it, does that give the shed light on how this transition from sort of the pre technology, pre industrial revolution to the industrial revolution era, how does it work exactly? Okay. So, um, that's what we're going to do going forward. And the ways we're going to do it are like, you, you can, I've already sort of broadcasted them a little bit, change the assumption on the, it, maybe there's not a fixed amount of land or maybe land is capital, but there's also more types of capital like machines that you can just arbitrarily reproduce if you want, if you put in the resources to do so. Okay. Uh, or maybe um, the demographic rule here, this thing is different. Okay. And that's primarily what the homework is about. Okay. Or maybe you have that and technological growth. Okay. So we can add in and change stuff and maybe we can you know, get away from this stagnation prediction. And in fact, we will be able to. Okay. Um, and that's going to try to provide sort of a segue into the, what we do next, which is stuff based on this solo model, which, which actually has a richer notion of capital. Okay. Um, and reflects more like modern technological growth as we see it. Okay. Um, all right. So then like I said, I'm going to just at the end here, because I only have five minutes, uh, go back to, where am I? There we go. Uh, go back to the homework and, and give you some, uh, yeah, uh, some help on understanding that. Okay. So, um, all right. So like I said, one question, four parts. Okay. So basically I'm going to give you this different, um, uh, demographic rule that, that relates Y over L to population growth. What you can see is that it's, uh, negative we related. So it's minus something times Y over L here. Okay. So here, this is the max of this constant N1 and the, and this thing that looks like the demographic rule So that what it, basically it's going to go down. Okay. But then at some point it's going to like bottom out. Okay. So you can think about N1 as like, um, 2%, like that's like the normal, once you become rich, a rich country, that's like 2% population growth or 1% or whatever it is. Uh, okay. Uh, and then, but before that occurs, there's like a decreasing zone, which is kind of what you see in the data. Okay. So just to, for the you know, part, I just want you to plot that. So just go through and think about what that max means. It basically sort of cuts it off. It's a minimal value. Okay. Cause if this one gets too small, then the, the N one is the max. So it, yeah. Okay. It's kind of confusing and the max cuts it off at a min, but that's how it works. Okay. So I'll have you plot that. Okay. And then the part B, I guess is really the, the major part of the question is, um, 
you know, you ha imagine what happens if you have this and technology is growing. So Z just keeps growing. Okay. Um, and, and what do you, what's going to happen in the long run? Okay. And is what happens in the long run, uh, a fixed outcome or does it depend on like where you started, you know, like maybe if you start too low, you get stuck there. If you start high enough, then you, you keep growing forever. Hint, that might be the answer. Uh, show that basically. Okay. So, so the important part is not just to get to an answer like that, but also to show why that is true. Okay. So that's, that's kind of what I want you to just sort of, and the way to do it is just, is draw that graph, draw a graph of, of this thing and just think through logically exactly what's going to happen. Okay. Um, okay. And then plot some, the part C, I want you, you know, when I, when I drew it in the, the, the slides here, I was dra drawing it on this graph here. Okay. Um, you know, you can also draw a time plot where you, you know, you have a jump from Z and you eventually decay back down. So that, that's what I want you to draw for that, for that part. Okay. Um, and then part D, I'm going to ask you to kind of think about, is this a reasonable assumption? Okay. And I, I'm actually going to ask you to argue that it's not a reasonable model. Okay. That things should break down. Okay. That maybe you have a really high incentive to find new land or something like that. So, so you start to think about like, what are people incentives to like find new land, for instance, if that grows and grows and grows, then probably that assumption of a constant amount of land isn't, isn't necessarily so reasonable because someone would want to go find more. Okay. We know there are explorers in the world and they're always going around trying to find new stuff. If the incentive to do that goes really high, presumably it's going to happen at some point. Okay. So, um, as long as there's some land out there to discover. Okay. So yeah. All right. So, uh, it's, it's a little, I think it's a little bit of a tough question. Okay. But there's only one that's perhaps good. Okay. You just focus on that. Okay. And then, uh, um, yeah, but then also, you know, think, you know, look at it over the, uh, weekend and we'll be back on Monday and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you some more stuff that'll probably be helpful and maybe give you some help. And then we'll also have, um, office hours on Tuesday. Okay. I don't know. Did I add, I might've forgotten to, um, put that in the syllabus. Uh, yeah, I did. Okay. So we're gonna have office hours on Tuesday, basically the day before the homework is due next week. So we can ask more questions there if you got them. Okay. So, so think about it over the weekend. If you have questions, we have the class on Monday and also office hours on Tuesday. All right. Uh, okay. So, and there, um, yeah, uh, I think, yeah, I think that's it. So good, good luck with the homework and you know, if anything seems if you have any questions, of course, also feel free to email me and I should respond pretty quickly. All right. Uh, thank you. And I'll see you next week.